Over the last 25 years, I've had the privilege of interviewing and highlighting some truly interesting people. Everyone who is anyone, both the famous and the infamous, from presidents and their first ladies to kings and queens, movie stars and pop stars, captains of industry, heads of state, sports personalities, innovative entrepreneurs, and some pretty fascinating everyday people. Today, I'm very proud to introduce you to Dr. Jeffrey Borer, a world-renowned cardiologist among the top 1% of physicians who says helping his patients is still the most rewarding aspect of his career. Dr. Borer, it's a pleasure to see you again. I would love for you to tell our audience just a little bit about your educational background and what led you to get to where you are today. I uh, went to high school in Brooklyn, New York. I went to public high school in Brooklyn. Uh, and in fact, my office now at Downstate Medical Center is within a short walk of my high school. <laughs> You're a creature of habit. You like to be where you, where you, were, where you grew up. That's, that's right, although I've been in a lot of places in between. Um, <clears throat> When I graduated from high school, I did my undergraduate work at Harvard, where I uh, received a degree in political science. Uh, it was called government there. And uh, from, uh, from Harvard, I went to Cornell, Wild Cornell Medical College uh, to study medicine. When I finished my, uh, my medical education, uh, I did my training at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, and from there I went to the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in Bethesda, Maryland, where I spent several years. Uh, one year I took out to go to London to be a senior Fulbright scholar at Guy's Hospital in London. And from there I came back to the NIH, uh, spent several more years there, and finally did what I always planned to do, which was to return to Cornell on the full-time faculty. Uh, I was there for 30 years uh, when I received an offer that I really couldn't refuse to go back to Brooklyn uh, to uh, what's now called the uh, State University of New York Downstate uh, University of the Health Sciences, which is across the street from my high school. Uh, I went back there as uh, chief of cardiology, but quickly also became chairman of medicine. And now I, uh, I, I run two large research institutes within the downstate uh, penumbra, though I, I uh, maintained my appointment at Cornell as an adjunct professor of cardiothoracic, uh, of cardiovascular medicine in cardiothoracic surgery. Sir, you do know, um, as the National Volunteer for the American Heart Association and a heart disease survivor myself, I just love hearing about your professional path because it's people like me who have benefited tremendously from your work over the years. And I get to tell you to your face how grateful I am, sir. Well, I'm delighted to hear that. I'm glad it's all worked out well for you. So what drew you toward the field of cardiology, sir? When I was uh, younger, when I was in high school and in college, I was always involved in sports and athletics. And <clears throat> it occurred to me, or it seemed to me, that when people were identified as having heart disease, they were told they had to sit on the sidelines, they couldn't participate. I didn't think that was, that, that was very much fun, so I thought it would be very nice to be involved in an area where I could prevent people from having to sit on the sidelines. Uh, being interested in sports, I was interested in how muscles work. Uh, when I uh, went through my training, though there is a field of medicine that deals specifically with muscle physiology, the way muscles work, um, <clears throat> it was not a large field at the time. However, I reasoned that the heart is a muscle, so I can deal with it there. And so the combination of being interested in muscle physiology and being interested in preventing people from having to sit on the sidelines instead of participating in sports uh, was what drew me to cardiology. And we are again very grateful for the amount of work that you've done. I am someone who has advocated, sir, that um, 
open heart surgery saved my life, but cardiac rehabilitation gave me my life back. And rehab gives you the ability to not have to stay on the sidelines, as you so eloquently put it. That's absolutely true. Cardiac rehab is uh, something that's grown over the years as more and more has been learned about the effects of specific rehab programs and they're very effective. So I, I think that, that you're absolutely right. Dr. Barr, I know that you've received a number of accolades and honor for your work. I'd love for you to share the ones that mean the most and something tells me it's the ones that have to do with your peers. Yes, that's true. The, uh, the awards that mean the most are the ones that are selected by peer review. Um, and I've received several of those. Um, they're always, they always mean more than, than uh, awards that come from a committee or come from a friend or something like that. So, yeah. So tell me a little bit about the particular award and why those mean the most to you. Well, uh, I received a Lifetime Achievement Award from the um, Associated Heart Valve Societies of, of the United States and Europe. Uh, that means a lot to me because, the, uh, because that's the work that I focus on, heart valve disease. Um, so that, that's, it's been very nice to, to, to get that kind of recognition. Um, the <clears throat> American Cardiovascular Research Institute uh, it is another source of awards. I've received two named awards from that entity. Uh, both of them were voted on by the membership of the, of the Institute, so, or the Academy rather, uh, so that uh, I, I think it was, it, was very, uh, it was very nice for me to have received that kind of accolade. I know that you have particularly um, contributed not just research, but innovations and technologies that other cardiologists around the world uh, use in um, servicing patients. So can you talk a little bit about those innovations? Uh, without question, the development that was uh, the most important in which I've been involved was um, <clears throat> the creation of exercise radionuclide cineangiography. This is a method that isn't used very much anymore, unfortunately, uh, that involves injecting a radioactive chemical into the bloodstream, allowing it to equilibrate within the bloodstream, and then placing the patient under a radiation camera, radiation detector, uh, which collects the data from the underlying radioactive, uh, uh, the, the radioactive blood and identifies the shape of the blood pool, the, without going into technical terms, the result of that is the capacity to measure the function of the heart, not only while the patient is at rest, but also during intense exercise, which brings out the abnormalities that would often not be present at rest. I went and presented this stuff at the, uh, at the American Heart Association meeting in November of 1976. And it was, the response was extraordinary. Uh, the, a story appeared in 500 newspapers the next day. One of the wire services picked it up. Uh, and it became a, a major underpinning of my career. From someone who has sat in that audience at the American Heart Association scientific sessions, which is what you're talking about. It's what I always call our Super Bowl. It's where the most brilliant people who work in, as clinicians, as researchers, as scientists, come to talk about the heart and to um, present their new innovations and, and their suggestions for how we can attack this problem. And so you with this beautiful humility and just saying, oh yeah, those were my contributions. Well, I can certainly tell you, those are not little contributions. Those are major contributions. And one of which was definitely used to help save my life. So I am very grateful. Well, it's, very very nice. grateful. it's very nice of you to say. 
So you've talked to us uh, about um, the accolades, the honors. We've talked about the research and the innovations. Um, obviously, the, some of those are just tremendous highlights of your career. Um, outside of your work, sir, how do you stay connected to the community? I was uh, a coach of my son's Little League baseball team. You had time for that? <laughs> that was on the weekend. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> uh, and my daughter's soccer team and basketball team. Uh, and I, um, I'm on the restoration committee for the um, uh, Brooklyn Jewish Center, which is a, a very old and highly respected synagogue in Brooklyn that my grandfather and my grandmother's brothers helped to found. It was founded in 1919. Uh, it was probably the first conservative um, Jewish synagogue in the United States, or close to it if it wasn't the first. Uh, you know, the difference between Orthodox and Conservative is that Orthodox and the Orthodox Synagogue, the men and the women are totally separated. In the Conservative Synagogue, excuse me, there's a row in which men and women can sit together when we're old. <laughs> You're old. Uh, the, um, uh, in addition, the Brooklyn Jewish Center was one of the earliest, if not the earliest, of the, of the Jewish centers, that is, the uh, concept was create a, an entity where people could get together and do a lot of things, not just go to the synagogue and pray, uh, but ha have a gym and a swimming pool and other activities, lectures, dances, whatever, uh, and the Brooklyn Jewish Center did that. So Dr. Burr, what's the one thing that you'd like the viewer of this feature to walk away with um, since we were talking about the fact that um, providing service to your patients is still at the top of your list of importance? Yeah. Uh, it, it is important for people to realize, I think most people think of doctors as people who evaluate the health of other people and try to manage health problems that the other people have. And that's true. That's the primary role of a doctor. But uh, doctors have other roles as well, including teaching new doctors uh, and creating new knowledge through research. Those are the three legs of the stool that a doctor sits on. I try to do all those things. Not everybody does. You don't have to do it on all three things, but that's what I try to do. And I think that it would be good for people to remember that these three functions are the three functions that are subserved by people who are doctors. Uh, they, they would have a better understanding of why doctors do what they do uh, if they understood the three functions. Well, sir, I'm going to tell you right now, I have a wonderful understanding of why doctors do what they do. It is really and truly to serve the community, and I am grateful for your service, as are the many, many patients that you've had over the years and the many, many students that you've taught, as well as the colleagues that you've influenced. So thank you, Dr. Moore. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. Thank you very much, Dora. I very much enjoyed it.